start with a prayer in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Lord God, and Lord, we thank you, Lord, for your blessings, we thank you that you brought us here, we ask Lord, that you would be with us um, over the course of these next four weeks, but uh, today, to really begin to understand um, all the different tools that we have in order to know ourselves so that we may know you, Lord. Um, so guide us in the, uh, today in the this series, and um, here it says we say together, our Father, and the Lord, and heaven. All right. So, I'm going to start off this series and share a little story about myself and kind of how this kind of works into our series. I'm going to start off by saying, the cost of ignorance is high. The cost of ignorance, and really self-ignorance is high. I'm going to share that, how I experienced that personally, okay? And I'm going to work that into why the Enneagram is a powerful tool for us to use. So, what I want to share is that way back in 2010, when I was ordained to priesthood, I would, to priesthood, to be honest, took me by surprise. Not the date or not that I found myself in Egypt, okay, all of a sudden, but priesthood took me by surprise because I had a very low degree of self-knowledge, okay? I had a very low degree of self-knowledge when I was ordained. And that lack of self-knowledge would cost me big. It would cost me big because I knew myself to be a bit of a, a people pleaser, all right? And, you know, you take a people pleaser and you put them into the priesthood and then you take that one verse that St. Paul said that I became all things to all people that I might win some, you all of a sudden have a very, very explosive combination right there, all right? So I was an easygoing person. I hope to think I still am an easygoing person, all right? I'm a go with the flow sort of person. I was okay with being indifferent as long as, um, you know, everything moved along slowly. Like, people would ask me my opinions and preferences about different things, and oftentimes I would kind of just fold, like, hey, whatever you want to do is fine with me. And so, I kept on doing that in order to avoid having to spend a lot of time and energy expressing my preferences and my opinions and things like that, and having to deal with the opinions and preferences of others, that stuff takes a lot of time and energy. And so I wanted to avoid that. I like conserving my energy. All right? And so I always deferred to everybody else. You want to do this? Okay, we can do that. You want to do that? No problem. We can do this. Oh, I think that's a great idea. And, and so on. And so... What I wasn't convinced of then was that aiming to please all people was an unrealistic and impossible stance to take in life. All right? But with every meeting, conversation, interaction, I would always concede to the other at that moment, thinking that it made the situation easier. All right? The alternative which is expressing my opinions, expressing my preferences, and all these different things, and wanting to do things in a certain way, would be a lot of headache with, in my estimation, very little return. So I kept unfolding my preferences, and unfolding, okay, and suppressing my wants and desires and my opinions and stuff like that, essentially what I was doing was denying who I was. Okay? I, like, every person has thoughts and preferences and opinions. When we continue to suppress them and ignore them and walk away from them, eventually what happens is you suppress yourself. And that's what I was doing over time. But I thought I was doing it for a very righteous reason, the priesthood, learning to win people, becoming all things to all people. So with every conversation, every decision, all right, I was denying myself, and eventually, like, as I denied myself over and over and over, all right, I often ran out of real estate of myself. There was no more I could, like, concede, and that led to a lot of tension. So where I appeared to be a very easygoing person, you put me in the car and I would beat my steering wheel. Because I was so angry. I was a raging bull inside my car. But to everybody else, whatever you want 
tool. Okay? I was giving myself away. And eventually, when I would run out of giving away preferences and opinions, okay, I would give away morals and values. And the cost became higher and higher. All right? The ante went up. And without a doubt, anybody who begins to fold on their morals and values, life will crash. And that's exactly what happened for me. Life crashed. Everything that I thought was, you know, was working well and just kind of like sustaining, all of a sudden crashed down. And everything that I drew a bit of my identity from was ripped away from me. And I would say, thank God. Thank God it was all ripped away from me. And there's a really, really dark period in, in, in my life around 2013, you know, for the next year and a half or so after that, where even when I would try and put pieces together and kind of please people to kind of ease the tension of the situation, everything that I was trying would fail. Everything I was trying would fail. And again, thank God it did. Only after doing some kind of self-reflection and taking time away from the ministry and from the service and having to kind of work through and face the, the serious problems that I had created for myself, was that I slowly able to dig, you know, and find a way out of that hole. And like any hole that you look at in life, any hole that you look at in life, hindsight is always 2020. And I can't tell you, in that season of my life, I have looked back at it through different lenses. And every time I've kind of grown in a certain stage of my life and taken a chance to look back at what had happened, I learned something new. And I learned lessons that have been so formative and transformative for me. That I will never stop looking back at the situation, not in order to live through it, but to learn from it. And over the last year, the Enneagram is something that came into my life, and I started to read it, and it started to make sense in a very, very weird way, in a way I couldn't really explain. And when I started to look back at what had happened to me, through and with the help and knowledge of the Enneagram, I have uncovered yet another layer of what had happened. Not everything makes sense to me when I look back. I can't piece together and answer all the questions, but definitely a good layer has been revealed to me as far as why did I get myself in that situation, all right? Knowing myself as a number nine, or also known as a peacemaker, helped me explain a lot of what I was doing back then that led to the falling apart of my life, and for good reason. And we talk about the Enneagram, all right? But the Enneagram comes with a bit of timeless wisdom, all right? Though we are so close to ourselves, we are also very, very far away from ourselves in the same way. That we live with ourselves, but we don't always know ourselves. And there's a big difference, okay? I, this is my physical body, it is none of yours. I walk around with it, go to sleep with it, do everything with it. Just because I own it and I live inside of it doesn't mean I know it. All right? And David, the psalmist, in Psalm 51, verse 6, he said, Behold, you desire truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden parts you will make me to know wisdom. What is David saying? That you, God, want me to know what is inside Okay, desire truth in the inward parts. And in the hidden part, hidden part, you will make me to know wisdom. What is David saying? That there are parts of me that I don't understand. There are parts of me that are so deep inside that I can't figure out on my own. And so only with your help and with your wisdom do you all of a sudden begin to reveal what is going on inside of me. Alright, you make me to know wisdom. David wrote that in the Psalms. We have in the Old Testament. Let's look at something else from one of the early church fathers. St. Clement of Alexandria said this, It is then, as appears, the greatest of all lessons to know oneself, 
For if one knows himself, he will know God, and by knowing God, he will be made like God. All right? This is an awesome one. Is then, it is then, as appears, the greatest lesson of all to know oneself. For if one knows himself, he will know God, and by knowing God, he will be made like God. We're going to come back to this quote in a little bit. But what St. Clement of Alexandria is saying, back in the second century, I believe, when he wrote this, is that the key to knowing God is to knowing myself. Okay, one of the keys to knowing God comes in knowing myself. All right? So we did the Old Testament in B.C. We did early church fathers in the first couple of centuries. All right? We're going to jump all the way up to the 21st century. Rutgers psychologist Daniel Goleman wrote a landmark paper published in the, Biz the Harvard Business Review. All right? And the title of it is What Makes a Leader? What Makes a Leader? Sorry, it's a big quote. All right, but this article, I think, was published in the 1990s and really is one of those landmark articles that is always re referred to, all right? The most effective leaders are all alike in one crucial way. They all have a high degree of what has come to be known as emotional intelligence. It's not that IQ and technical skills are irrelevant. They do matter, but they are the entry-level requirements for executive positions. My research, along with the research studies, clearly show that emotional intelligence is the sine qua non, which is a fancy way of saying absolutely indispensable, okay, if you are going to be a leader, all right, absolutely indispensable of leadership. Without it, a person can have the best training in the world, an incisive analytical mind, and an endless supply of smart ideas, but he still won't make a great leader, all right? And just to kind of piece that apart, what are the five components of emotional intelligence? Self-awareness, self-regulation, motivation, empathy for others, social skills, and relationship management. All these things which a common business world looks at are all things that really fall under this idea or understanding of self-knowledge. So we're talking about what David was saying in the Old Testament, talking about what, you know, first century, uh, Early church father St. Clement of Alexandria is saying, among many, many other church fathers who have said similar quotes along that, those lines of knowing the self, to all the way in the future, Harvard Business Review, saying the same thing. So there must be a bit of wisdom in this idea or understanding or concept of what it is to know yourself. All right? What it is to know yourself. So now let's go back to St. Clement of Alexandria. In Clement of Alexandria, and I want to highlight just the second half of what he says, for if one knows himself, he will know God, and by knowing God, he will be made like God. Alright? Two weeks ago I talked about personal mission statement, which I took from Stephen Covey of Seven Habits, and one of the habits he said, begin with the end in mind. Okay? We take that concept, and we say, what is St. Clement of Alexandria saying? What is the, you know, beginning with the end in mind? What is the end in mind? To be made like God. To be made like God. Alright? That's what our goal is. Here on earth, what are we called to do? Be imitators of Christ. St. Paul said, imitate me like I imitate Christ. Alright? That's our goal here. We take that one step further into salvation. It's an eternal union with God. Alright? But so when we begin with the end in mind, and we begin to work backwards, what is he saying? What are our first steps? Knowing the self. Knowing ourselves. Alright? David emphasized in Psalm 51 that the hidden parts, in the hidden parts, you will make me to know wisdom. You will make me to know wisdom. In the hidden parts of myself, you will enlighten me, you will show me, you will reveal things to me, in them begins my journey to becoming like God. All right. So when we talk about the Enneagram, 
you know, what I want to do is give it a theological context. Okay? A theological context. Because I think with a theological context, this is not just a self-help book. Alright? And I don't want us to approach it like a self-help book. This is one tool, and many tools, that we can use. Alright? But when we have the appropriate theological context, then we're going to be able to use the tool in the right way. And so, that's a verse from David. And so, I need to jump into one more thing before we actually get to the Enneagram. <coughs> Alright? To give it a little bit more theological context because we're talking about what's our end goal? To be made in the image, we are made in the image of God, but to grow in the image of God. Okay? To grow in the image of God. Alright? But that growth process has a key step which happened back in the garden. And so, when you go back to the garden and understand what happened when Adam and Eve sinned. What happened to humanity when Adam and Eve sinned. And St. Athanasius on the Incarnation, he says this, then turning from the eternal things, which is turning from God, okay, to things corruptible by the counsel of the devil, they have become, which is humanity, okay, re being represented by Adam and Eve, humanity have become the cause of their own corruption and death, okay? Humanity had become the cause of their own corruption and death. What he's saying, by the choice that they made in the garden, by turning their focus and their view away from God and to and under the counsel of the devil, chose to eat of the apple, what did they bring to themselves? When they sinned, and what did sin do? It brought corruption and death. And what did corruption and death do? It separated us from them. Okay? Is why in, in the simplest form we look at sin as a separation from God. Sin is a separation from God. Alright? Everybody with me? Any questions? Great. So we have this separation from God. Okay? And Jesus came and he took on humanity. You know, unified it with his divinity. He died, conquering death, rose, and ascended to heaven, and now, like, remade what humanity was supposed to look like. Okay? He was the perfect picture of humanity. Okay? When perfectly united with divinity. But you and I still have sin that we're dealing with. We have sinful natures. And sin separates us from God. Alright? Now, one of the greatest things that we have in our church, okay, are those who have took this battle with sin very, very seriously. Okay? And they went to go battle sin seriously by leaving the world, okay, by leaving, like, common society and heading to the devil. All right? And in the desert, what did they do? They battled sin. Who was our greatest example of that? St. Anthony, okay? the father of monasticism. And what did St. Anthony do? He went out, he secluded himself, devoted himself to prayer, to a set of works, and all these things. Why? In order to battle sin. In order to battle sin. And many others followed his footsteps in order to fight the battle against sin. Because in that battle of sin, when we fight that battle with the grace of the Holy Spirit, what happens is we begin to unify our, ourselves with God, and we become more and more in His image. Alright? Now, with St. Anthony, okay, there's somebody else who came into the desert, St. Macarius, okay, which he would begin to organize, um, he began to organize monasteries. Okay, and one of the people who came into the monasteries in about the middle of the fourth uh, century, about mid 350s, all right, that's fourth century, was somebody known as Evagrius of Ponticus. Evagrius of Ponticus. All right. Now, just give a little bit of context of who this Evagrius of Ponticus is. 
All right? And I know many of you kind of are giving me like, where are we going with this? Okay? I thought we were talking about a yellow book. Trust me, we're going to get to the yellow book, but this is, you know, providing some context. And also strength to what this yellow book is going to talk to us about, what the Enneagram is. All right? So Evagrius of Ponticus, all right, was one of the disciples of St. Basil the Great, okay, who ordained him a reader. And St. Gregory of Nazianzus ordained him a deacon. He was, you know, called to be elevated to a bishop, but he ran away from that and wanted to go focus in the desert, all right? And he learned from St. Macarius, uh, the great, kind of the father of, of monasticism, and so on. So Evagrius and Ponticus wrote a book called the Practicos, okay? The Practicos. It's an easy read, only a hundred chapters, okay? Only a hundred chapters, not a problem. I went to go look for this book, and no joke, like every book that I found about the Practicos only said chapters on prayer. <laughs> like they can even publish a whole book, all right? They can only take sections of it and publish that, all right? But in th this book, the Practicos, something that he wrote about, okay, were the eight passions, okay? The eight passions of the flesh and eight practices against those passions. Eight practices against those passions, okay? Those eight passions, we probably commonly know them as the seven deadly sins, okay? So these eight passions have kind of morphed depending on who had their hands on it and was talking about it. Might have been eight, might have been seven, and nine, and different things like that. But what his focus was, was what were the passions living inside of us that we are all struggling with, okay? And how do we begin to deal with the passions that live inside of us? Because when we deal with the passions, then I have a chance of becoming more like Christ. If I don't deal with the passions, then the passions are given free will, free reign to do whatever they want inside of me. All right, so they saw that he wrote about the passions, wrote about certain behaviors, okay, and ascetical works in order to deal with the passions. And they also, they also found literature and some diagrams in his writing that looked something like this, okay? which is an Enneagram. Now, after his death in 399, his writings were taken out of Egypt and, and spread among the Eastern Orthodox churches and, and so on and began to influence a lot of different monasteries. All right? And over time, now we're going to really fast forward, over time, his writings along with the writings of others and, and so on matured into what we have today and know as the Enneagram, okay? Enneagram. So we talk about the purpose of the Enneagram with hopefully this theological understanding and kind of historical context, okay? The roots of the Enneagram are focused on the separation, uh, on the separation of God that happens in me because of sin living inside of me, okay? And that everybody here deals with sin, okay? You might have a different sin than you, okay? I have a different sin than you. But if we continue to look and look and look around millions of people over the centuries, we'll find, and what the church fathers found was that we tend to see eight or nine of these, seven, eight or nine of these, surface over and over and over as roots, all right? So there's something that is unifying us in the way that we sin, all right? So we started to identify these eight. All right, so the Enneagram, its roots are really focused on the, the things that we struggle with, okay? Because what we don't know can and will hurt us. It's just a matter of when. What we don't know can and will hurt us. The Enneagram is a spiritual tool for self-knowledge. The Enneagram is a spiritual tool for self-knowledge, all right? When we understand ourselves, then as St. Clement said, we begin that journey to know God and become like Him. All right? It's not the be-all, end-all. It is not the only way to understand ourselves. Okay? Fathers have gone out to the desert, and they have figured out themselves. Okay? One of the greatest quotes is, go to yourself, and your self will teach you everything. Why? Because you're self-reflecting. All right? So knowing the self is essential. The Enneagram is not exact science, 
All right? The Enneagram, because while in discovering your sin and your weakness, you also discover great things about your personality. The Enneagram is not to stroke your personality. Okay? It's not saying, I am a number four. I'm a number three. That's not the purpose of it. Okay? We will discover things, but it's not the purpose of it. All right? So that's the Enneagram. The purpose of the Enneagram. Now let's kind of talk about the Enneagram. Enneagram, Enea is nine, gram is figure. Okay? So we have a nine-pointed figure. All right? It's thought to be an ancient personality typing system. And what it essentially says is that there are nine personality types in this world. Okay? There are nine personality types in this world. Before you stop and say, there's no way that all the billions of people in this world fit into nine personality types, okay? I'd like to take you to the aisle at Home Depot, okay? Go to the aisle at Home Depot, and you go to the paint section, okay? There are an unbelievable number of colors of paint, okay? But despite the number of colors of paints, what do we have? Primary colors. Each one of these colors are a mix-up of the primary colors. Okay? There's a foundation, the primaries, okay? But you can express the primaries in a bunch of different ways. Okay? We're going to see how that idea kind of works into the Enneagram. Alright? So while the colors are infinite, the primary colors are defined. Okay? While the expression of personalities is, is vast, okay, what the Enneagram is suggesting is that there are nine basic ones. Okay? Nine basic ones. So let's get a little bit familiar with what are these nine basic personality types. Alright? Any questions? Right? We will talk about the lines that go up and down and make the stars and all that stuff. Hang with me. Let's talk about the nine personality types. All right? Number one, the perfectionist. Okay? The perfectionist, also sometimes known as the reformer. All right? They are ethically minded people. All right? They are dedicated. They're reliable. They're motivated by, de by a desire to live right and do the right thing all the time. They want to improve the world. And they look at themselves and, and they and they want to be, they want to avoid any fault or blame being brought upon themselves. Okay? So that's number one. The perfectionist, peace, or the perfectionist or the reformer. Number two, the helper. This is a warm, caring, loving, giving person. They're motivated by a need to be loved and needed by those around them. So a helper is motivated by the desire and the need to be loved and needed by those around them, okay? But they avoid acknowledging their own needs, okay? The performer, this is a success-oriented, image-conscious individual wired for productivity. They're motivated by a need to be or appear to be successful and to avoid failure, okay? The performer, they can take on a bunch of different masks, okay? They can be kind of whoever you want, but for the different motivations than a peacemaker. All right, romantic. Now, this individual is creative, sensitive, and moody. Don't you feel like you're kind of reading ads in like dating app or something like that? This individual, right? No, no, okay, so the romantic, all right? They're creative, they're sensitive, and they're moody. They're much, very much in touch with their emotions, okay? They're motivated by a need to be understood. They experience oversized feelings, Okay? And avoid being ordinary. So this is a person who always wants to be unique. Okay? Romantic. The investigator. This, this individual is analytic, detached, and private. They're motivated by a need to gain knowledge, okay, conserve energy, and avoid relying on other people. I know I'm going through it, but over the next three weeks, we're going to take these three by three and really look into them in detail. I'm just kind of wet the appetite. Loyalists, all right? Loyalists are committed, practical, and witty, all right? But they are the worst case scenario thinkers in, in life, all right? You ask a loyalist, like, what's the big deal with, like, 
you know, crossing the street, like, crossing the street, what are you talking about? Like, a million different things gonna happen. You know, what if you meet the chicken in the proverbial joke? Like, what happened when the chicken crossed the road? Like, what happens if the car runs? Like, these are the worst case scenario thinkers, all right? So, they, worst case, scenarios, worst case scenario thinkers are motivated by fear and a need for security. Okay, an enthusiast, this person is fun, spontaneous, adventurous. They're motivated by a need to be happy, okay? And they, and they want to avoid dealing with pain. So in order to avoid pain, they move towards happiness. In order to deal with the happiness, they become, you know, they create different things for them. They're always doing different things, all right? The challenger. This is an individual who is commanding, intense, and confrontational. You think of high-powered executives, they're generally challengers, all right? They like to call it how it is, they will tell you how they think to your face, and they want you to do the same back, all right? They don't want the fluff, that's a challenge, all right? Peacemaker, this is me, all right? Pleasant, laid back, and accommodating, all right? Makes it perfect, it's just kind of <laughs> No worries, I got my problem. All right, it's a pleasant, laid back, and accommodating. They're motivated by a need to keep the peace, okay, and merge with others to avoid conflict. Okay, we merge with others to avoid conflict. So these are the nine personality types, okay? Now these nine personality types are broken up into three groups, okay? Three groups. You have the anger triad, eight, nine, and one, you have the heart triad, which is two, three, and four, okay? And then you have the fear triad, which is five, six, and seven, okay? Anger, like heart, heart, or sometimes people associate it with feel, fear, uh, shame, sorry, and then fear, okay? So eight, nine, and one, two, three, and four, five, six, and seven. So give you an example. So I'm a nine, I'm married to a one. We have a very angry household, okay? We will talk about how we deal with that, all right? You know, we also start to see like a little bit of our kids. And we start to, you know, look and, and start to wonder, what are our kids? And that influences the way we deal with our kids as well, all right? So let's talk about these triads. We'll take the first one, the anger triad. So eights, which is the challenger, they are the ones who are kind of those high power executives they externalize their anger. So they'll project their anger on everybody else. So picture like the board meeting or how the, the chief executor is really upset and just kind of like they externalize their anger. All right, the nine, we forget about our anger. All right, we don't want to deal with conflict and the problem with that, so we forget about it. The problem is that anger lies dormant and then it rears its ugly head, okay? Because we can't really forget about anger, we have to process it, all right? Then one, they internalize it. Meaning, they, they turn on themselves and they become the hardest critic on themselves, okay? So eight, nine, and one. Then, we go to the, the second triad, the heart or the feeling triad, all right? These are driven by their emotion, these two, the two, three, and four. Two is the helper, three is the performer, and four is the romantic, all right? Over the course of four weeks, you will get used to the numbers, okay? So... Twos, the helper, they focus on the feelings of others. So a helper will look and be like, oh, you look like you need this, okay? They see and read the feelings of others, and they help. Three, okay, which is the uh, performer, they have trouble recognizing their own feelings because they're too busy working towards success, so they have trouble recognizing their own feelings or the feelings of others, all right? Four, the romantic, they concentrate on their own feelings, okay? They just focus, they experience their feelings. They have grandiose feelings, all right? This triad is the most image conscious triad, okay? They're really worried about their perception, how people perceive them. Then the last one, the fear triad, okay? Five, the investigator. They are the ones who kind of, uh, they externalize it, and so they find security in the things that they have, okay? They try and find security in collecting things. Six, the uh, loyalists, so this is the worst case scenario thinkers, they internalize it. They're the ones sitting up at night being like, oh gosh, what's gonna happen tomorrow? Oh, oh, oh. That's, that's, 
you know, how they deal with it, okay? Loyals, all right? The seven, which is the enthusiasts, they forget about it, okay? They forget about their, their pain and they go towards, or, or their fear of dealing with pain and they go towards, they get busy with different things, okay? So that's the enthusiasts. This triad, they think a lot before um, they act. They think, they plan, and then they act, all right? So triads, anger, the heart, and the fear triad. All right, any questions? Doing good. Let's talk about wings, okay? So each number has two other personality types on their side, okay? You will lean to one side or the other, okay? You will draw personality traits from one side or the other, okay? So here, I said I'm a nine, I'm a nine with a one wing, okay? So I'm a peacemaker, but there's a perfectionist too, okay? Perfectionist is, look back at St. Barnabas, our mission statement, and St. Susanna. If those three aren't lined up, that drives me nuts, okay? If those are crooked, that drives me nuts. The people who set up in the morning, they know that, okay? Because there's a bit of me that is just like, uh, like I look and be like, that's perfect. You load my dishwasher the wrong way, I'm gonna reload it, okay? I have to do it a different way. There's a perfectionist aspect in me, all right? So, while I am peaceful, I am particular, okay? And we'll talk about that as things go on. Example, Sarah, my wife, she's a one, but she has a two wing. So she's a perfectionist, but she's a two wing helper. I'll give you an example. One night she was working late. She came home at nearly 9.30 or something like that at night. I had been working on a letter and in that letter there were pictures and stuff like that. And I was so proud of what I had done, okay? I was like, Sarah, come look at this. And I, looked, I showed her the pictures and the letter and stuff like that. And she got down on her knee. She took the mouse from me. She started to adjust all the pictures that I'd just been working on for the last like 45 minutes. She zoomed in, she tilted it, she's like, yeah, do this and this and this. Like, she's a perfectionist, okay? But she's a helper. So even though she's tired, okay, she wants to help, all right? Perfectionist with a one wing, or a one with a two wing. Everybody has a wing. Everybody has a wing, and sometimes your wing can affect you in different ways. So, an example, like um, the four, the romantic, all right? A four with a three wing, which is a, a performer, okay, can be very outgoing, okay? They have grandiose emotions, but they're also, you know, they have a, you know, uh, they side towards uh, success, so they would be very outgoing. But if you take a four romantic and you give them a five wing, which is an investigator, they tend to be more introverted. All right? So here you begin to see that it's just not nine personality types, but these nine personality types begin to, they borrow from their sides, okay? And take on unique combinations, all right? But not only do we borrow or, or, or sit to one side or the other, but we have stress and security, okay? We all face stress and we all face times of security. And depending on stress and security, we will either move to another number or pull from another number, okay? And the way I want us to think about this is here, when we kind of look at this, all right, I'm going to take myself. So I'm a nine, all right? In times of stress, I will move towards the bad side of six. Okay, I become a worst case scenario thinker when I'm stressed out. I can't figure things out, I can't make decisions, I start to clam up and I become a rock and I, I, I can't move, okay? That's in times of stress, all right? So I move towards the bad side of six. In times of, of security when things are going well and stuff like that, I'm gonna draw from the good side of three which is a performer. Okay, so I become very 
you know, daring, courageous, like, let's try this, let's start this new ministry and different things like that. That's different things that will come out of me in times of security. But things are tight and things are tough, I can't decide anything. All right, so stress and security, I'll stress, I'll go to the bad side of six. Security, I will draw from the good side of three. Are we confused or are you with me? Okay, you're with me. Good. Every, everybody has this sort of thing. So we'll do one more. A helper, okay, in times of stress, will move to the bad side of eight. Meaning, what does that look like? So a helper is somebody who reads the emotions of others and knows what they want and starts to act on it. Okay? But under stress, they'll become demanding in, what, in how they want things to go and even manipulative. Okay? A, f a two, in times of security, okay, will pull from the good side of the individuals. Or, or number four is the, the romantic. Sorry. Different sources will call these different names, but the numbers are always the same. Okay? We'll draw from the good side of four, which we've been saying is romantic. Meaning, like, they like to help people, but they will do it from a healthy place. They're able to experience their own emotions instead of forgetting them and realize that they need to take care of themselves when in a safe place. All right. So we did the wings. We did the stress and security. All right. But what did we say the purpose of the Enneagram was? Okay? It was understanding ourself, because in ourself is sin, and sin separates us. So every number has a sin. Okay? Has a sin that they struggle with. This doesn't mean, okay, that you don't struggle with all the other sins. But it means that you probably float to a certain sin more frequently than others. Okay? You may float to a certain sin more frequently than others. All right, so let's kind of go through them. So one, the perfectionist anger. Okay, they need the world to be perfect. All right, and they set unrealistically high demands on themselves and others that when the demands aren't fed, met, they get angry. All right, two, the helper. They struggle with pride because they, in their minds and the way they see the world, they know what everybody needs. Okay, they know what you should do and, and how you should, you know, how you need to be helped, and they like to be recognized for them. They think that you can't live without them. All right, so they struggle with pride. Three, the performer deceit because they're so focused on becoming successful and presenting a successful image of themselves, they can please the crowd, but in pleasing the crowd, they can fool the crowd. Okay, they can fool the crowd. So they can deceive. Four, the romantic. Okay, they struggle with envy. In experiencing their emotions, they feel that their life is incomplete, and they feel that what is missing is found in somebody else. So they want what other people have, and they think that that will complete them. So they struggle with envy. Okay, five, the investigator. Okay, a various which is kind of a weird word, but it means greed for wealth or material stuff, all right? So five is the investigator. They tend to hold on to things because they, they want to be self-sustaining and independent, okay? They don't want to rely on other people, so they hold on to things. And in that, they can hold their love and affection to those closest to them, all right? Six, the loyalists. So these are the worst case scenario thinkers. They deal with fear, okay? They always think that the worst thing is going to happen, and so what they will do is they will tend to look for a belief system or authority figure and become loyal to them, and that gives their fear a little bit of rest, okay? So they tend to be fear, and they will need to learn how to trust God a little bit more. Eight, lust, okay? With eight is a challenger, that's a high-powered executive. All right, lust, but not in the sense of sexual lust. That's not necessarily what we're talking about. What we are talking about with them is that they lust for intensity, okay? They are kind of high-powered, high, like, go, 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 in your face. So they, they lust after intensity. They will always be pushing harder and harder and harder, okay? And number nine, all right, 
sloth. Okay? Sloth. Not physical laziness, okay? I'm a runner. I run at 5 a.m. I'm not lazy. I'm not physically lazy. But I have a tendency to become spiritually lazy. I can become very spiritually lazy and relationally lazy as well because relationships are very difficult. Okay? I run out of energy in relationships. And so I become lazy to conserve energy. All right? Not the great combination for a priest who deals with people <laughs> all the time, right? So I can tend to fall asleep to my own priorities, okay? I struggle with personal development and, and dealing with responsibilities, all right? We all got our struggles. We all got our struggles. But I can identify them, and it makes a big difference, all right? So we talked about the sin that we all struggle with. This isn't the only sin that we struggle with, but we can have a tendency to struggle with this sin more than others, okay? Now, each number, each personality type has yet another range. You can be unhealthy, average, and healthy within your personality type, okay? People who are unhealthy have a very low degree of awareness of what's going on inside of them, okay? And so life lives them. Their sin controls them, all right? Average people kind of have an idea of what's going on, but can kind of, you know, shift in the spectrum. And healthy people know what their weakness is, know what their gifts are, and know how to deal with it, okay? So they don't get to, none of us can change our personality type, okay? We are who we are. We can't change our personality type, but we can embrace our personality type. We can embrace who we are. We can embrace the sin that I struggle with. Okay, I can tell you, as a father confession, people that I've been with for a long time generally come with the same thing that they struggle with. Okay? Generally come with the same thing time and time again. All right? So within our numbers, we can, struggle, we can be unhealthy, average, or healthy, and we'll talk about what each number looks like in an unhealthy, average, and healthy stage. Okay? So, with that, all right, I really feel that this series has a lot of potential, okay? I, I can personally attest to how much it has helped me. People who come to me in confession or seek guidance, I have shared this book more and more, and it has brought insight into their life, okay? And has given us different things to talk about, and identify areas that they need to work on, all right? And so I think there's a lot of opportunity in the series, but it's gonna take some elbow grease, okay? Because what we want to do in this series is really build a sense of self-awareness. Self-awareness for myself, okay? Because when I'm self-aware, I will discover good things about me, and I'll discover really bad things about me, all right? So I need to be aware of both. Okay, because that's who I am. I am the totality of me, which is good and bad, sin and virtue. All right, I have to learn all of that, and I have to accept that in myself. I have to learn to accept that in myself. Because when I learn to accept it in myself, I learn to appreciate how God has made me and formed me. Okay, and it's not by chance, but it is divine will. So I need to accept who I am. Okay? And I need to learn to forgive myself and have compassion on myself. Okay? Because there are certain things where we will do and we're like, oh, again, I did it again. We need to learn to have compassion on ourselves and forgive ourselves. All right? And when we have compassion on ourselves, we have compassion to offer to others. Okay? And if you're married, your spouse will appreciate your compassion. Your family members will appreciate the compassion that you give them. So, there's a lot. But let's proceed with a little bit of caution, okay? Now, got some more. All right, as we go through this series, we're going to be talking about numbers and kind of talking about each number and what happens, okay? Your goal is not to name other people. 
Okay? Don't go and be like, oh, you're such a three. Oh, you foolish four. Why do you think the worst of every situation number six? Okay? That's not our goal. Okay? Your goal is to figure out your number. Okay? Your goal is to figure out your number. Don't be a number spoiler. Okay? Don't be like, I totally know what you are. Okay? Let them figure that out. Okay? Don't be a number spoiler. Because you could be wrong. Okay? You could be wrong. When you discover your number, stop trying to be like, no, I am not that one. I would much rather be this one. You can't change it. Okay? You can't change your number. Right? You need to learn to accept your number, appreciate it, become aware of it, and have compassion on yourself. All right? So, what I've been saying is that this, okay, this book, The Road Back to You, is our main book for this series. Okay? This is the book I want everybody to get. I've given you a brief introduction, and I would encourage you to read his introduction. Okay? I think he's got a very good introduction. He's a very entertaining author. He is a pastor at, at another church, but he's a very entertaining author. Okay? And I like the way his books read. All right? So this is the book I want everybody to get. Even if you didn't get it this week, you don't have it by today, I want you to get this book. Okay? This book has a study guide. Okay? You don't have to get the study guide. If you want the study guide, that's fine. I'm not going to talk about the study guide. Okay? But I do want you to have this book. I think it's a great resource for everybody to have. Okay? This book, okay, has two authors. The second author is Suzanne Seville. She wrote this book, okay, which is The Path Between Us. Which this book is very much focused on the relationships that your number, like how your number deals with specifically relationships around it, okay? But if you don't know your number, this one has a, this one is better because it provides like just the basic nuts and bolts of your personality type, okay? So this is what I would want you to read first to begin to understand who you are. And if you so choose, you can get this book. I've read this one too, and I found it to be also be insightful about my personality type and those that I love, you know, closest to me, all right? These two books came from this book, okay? This book bit of a hefty book, okay? I'm not recommending that you all get this. This is really, like, if you've done these two and you really want to go further, this is a book, this is done by Father Richard Rohr and Andreas Ebert. They give a lot of the history of, of Enneagram and stuff like that. They talk about how it dates back to the Bagrius of Ponticus and all that stuff. So if you want more detailed, you know, stuff, you can, you can go for this book, but this is the one I want everybody to have, okay? Now, keep on saying that this series is important for the following series, which is going to be a, a relationship-based series, okay? And in that relationship-based series, we're going to be using the study guide from this book, okay, for our community groups, okay? But in order to use this, one, you got to know your number, okay? you got to know your number. Now... Many of us always say, like, but I'm not a reader. I don't like to read. Suck it up. <laughs> okay? We need to challenge ourselves to grow. Okay? We can't play the, but I don't like to. We need to push ourselves. We can't say, like, oh, I'm not growing spiritually, and I'm not doing this, and, like, I'm not reading my Bible, I'm not reading this book, I'm not doing, like, at a certain point, like, we have to say, okay, time to grow, okay? Time to take things seriously, okay? If you don't like reading, there's an audio book. Have somebody read it to you, okay? But read the book. Now, you may not be able to get through the entire book. That's fine, okay? Though I strongly encourage you to. I want to talk about some things in this book. People might be thinking, well, what's the fast cut track to figuring out what my number is? Okay? Now, I know online, some of you may have found that there is an online test. 
Okay, and then you can take all these, answer all these questions, and it'll say you are likely this number. I actually don't recommend it, okay? Even though it's done by the author, um, I would encourage you to really, you know, challenge yourself to read, okay? You can read, you know, the, the summary of each number in the introduction, and if um, one of those numbers tends to kind of spark your interest and stuff like that, uh, what you can do is go to that chapter and what you have at the beginning of the chapter are questions that would kind of highlight different things that this personality type would be dealing with, okay? And if you think that's you, read the chapter. And if you're wrong, go back to the drawing, okay? How will you know if you found your number, okay? Everybody experiences it a little bit differently. I'll tell you my experience. When I read my number, I was like, how did this man spy on me? I found that somebody had spied on me, okay? I've been looking at my life, my childhood, all these different thoughts that I had in my head, I felt exposed, okay? I felt like sad about certain things in my chapter and about my personality type. I really regretted certain things and I didn't want to be like carry certain characteristics of my personality type, that's when I realized I had figured out my number, okay? Um, I'd read a couple of different numbers to, to maybe make sure that I knew it was mine, but for sure, without a doubt, I'm the nine with the one with me, okay? And it's becoming more and more clear to me. So, if the thing is like, when you read the book and you find your number, what you'll find, you gotta read your wing, okay? So you're gonna be reading one of your wings, okay? So there's two chapters out of nine. And then you go and you have a stress and a security number that you go to. So now you gotta have two more chapters, three and four, okay? And if you read one that's wrong, you gotta read the other one, so you've already read, read half the book, okay? To really figure out yourself, you've probably read half the book, all right? But again, take your time, deal with it. I want everybody to get it, because I want you to be reading about yourself. Okay? I think it's a very powerful tool. Any questions? No? Yes? Personality types focus on what is motivating us. Okay? So you, I, I mean, I can't tell you for you, but like you will find that there's some motivating force that is driving you to act this way at work and acting you this way at home. Okay? What we want to bring is cohesion. Like you can't be two different people. Okay? You are angry. Alright? So we need to figure out what it is. And so it's going to be a challenge. You will learn good things, you will learn bad things about yourself, okay? But the purpose behind it all is to identify ourselves, our sin, what we struggle with, in order to move closer to Christ. Mary. Can you be more than one number? No. You are one number, but you can have a wing, okay? You can be a very stressed out person and be pulling from another number too frequently, okay? And so you may think you're that number, but you're really just overly stressed. Okay? Good question. So like when you're trying to figure out your number, are you supposed to are you supposed to think of like look inward more? Like, you look, say that? Are you supposed to search within within yourself and try to like eliminate your um, the external forces and effects that are happening or um Again, like the motivation, like each number has a unique motivation, okay? And so what you want to try to identify is like what is your motivation? And so when you kind of like read through the, the quick summary of each number, see if one kind of, like if, if there's one that you identify with, okay? And then I would go to that chapter and, and read it and see if it kind of lines up. And, and if it doesn't, like you may be off on something. Okay, but again, a lot of this is self-awareness, and if we haven't spent time being self-aware, this can be very challenging, okay? I just talked to somebody who 
read the book, and I was like, oh, what number are you? He's like, I don't know, I'm either a nine or a five. I gotta read it again, <laughs> right? So it can be challenging, it can be challenging. Um, again, like, you can come and feel free to talk with me if, if you, you know, maybe need a little help guiding. I'm gonna say, like, uh, Sarah has read extensively as well. Um, and I go to her for a lot of questions that I have about Enneagram as well. She's also a resource if anybody wants to talk about that with her. But it's kind of hard, like, the book, the introduction will also talk about, like, there's a little part of finding your number, okay? So that would be a good place. Any other questions? All right, next week I'm going to ask you, hold up your book, okay? And I'm going to show a whole bunch of yellow books, you know, in the audience. Let's put some novel grease on. Let's go to work. It's going to be a great series. Okay, let's stand up. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and God, amen. Thank you, Lord, for your blessing. Thank you for your faith. And I uh, ask the Lord that you would be with us, that you would be with us as individuals on a journey. Uh, that you would help us, guide us, that you would give us uh, courage to, to be deep inside ourselves, to not be a very uncomfortable thing that we're struggling with, and to know that you always meet our, our sins when we confessing to you with love and compassion. And help us make plain compassion for ourselves as you give us compassion so that we may love and give compassion to them. Through the intercession of your sins and inclusion and the healing of your sins to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, now will be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we give for those who trespass against us. Give us the temptation, the blessing, now the love of God, the Father, and grace was only begun. Son, our Lord, God, and Savior, Jesus Christ, and gives the Holy Spirit, be with you all, go in peace, the Lord be with you. Happy number hunting. Next week we'll be doing the first triad, the anger triad, eight, nine, and one. <laughs>